So we're gonna we're gonna um, instead of tasting all three blind, we're gonna start and we're gonna taste the first bottle blind. Don't pour the full bottle out um, yet. And before we get too far along, do you have your swag bag from this distillery for tonight? You should have a big bag from them. Yes. Hopefully it's not rattling and clinking. Hopefully it's uh, nice and solid. So we're going to open that um, right after the reveal as well. So uh, bottle number one, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, to share with you. <laughs> oh, you gotta give, give, give some to that, that guy over there behind you. Wait, we have to share with him. We do have to share with him. That was kind of the deal. He comes in here and helps. <laughs> All right, so on the nose, I mean, first we start off with color, right? What did we notice on the color on this? Lighter. It, it is lighter. It is lighter. Really um, light. Wow. Yeah. All right, so if you guys want to go ahead and take your first taste. Amazing oil. Mm. Is that a good one? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Kind of apricot and cinnamon. Yeah. Yeah, definitely some stone, stony fruit. Yeah, I was like, thinking peach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, peach. I was getting a malted barley kind of yeah. finish to it. Most definitely barley. So you're thinking single malt? Single malt. I think so. Well, malt for sure. I don't know if it's just single. Fair enough. You didn't pick out a malted wheat. Well, but part malted, part barley, not malted. <laughs> it tastes more like beer than bourbon or whiskey. Okay. Proof. What are you thinking on proof on this? One low 100s? Not even. In the 90s. Yeah. Amazing legs. The oils are wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some crazy oils on this. And we're actually going to talk about that um, in this presentation with this distiller. Um, all right. I don't want to spend too much time on this part. I want you guys to tell me, though, what do you think? Like, um overall impression a light right. easy drinker all right how many of you guys think this is texas does it taste like a texas <laughs> does, it, does it have that bite it tastes yeah, like it frigid spray, but that's about it yeah yeah this does not taste like texas all right it's fair north. enough it's northern northern okay <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you say that? No, seriously, seriously let's, let's talk about that for half a second. Why do you say that? Why do you say Northern? Southern makes it tequila. <laughs> <laughs> you meant North of the Rio Grande. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. We're going to go ahead and, and reveal who this is. And uh, I'm going to introduce a couple of people to you. Um, this is Westward Whiskey. And Westward Whiskey is out of Portland, Oregon. And we're joined by Miles Monroe, who is their, uh, their head distiller, lead distiller, head blender. And Layla McGinnis. Layla is their, uh, their ambassador for the brand here. Um, Miles, thank you so much for joining us, bud. Um, we have had the privilege of, of meeting Miles several times. We've done several tastings, several events with Westward. Um, we visited the distillery. Um, it's It's... One of my favorite. Huh? Um, <laughs> uh, truly, though, and when it comes to single malts, especially outside of Texas, um, I'm going to tell you a story about their stuff because we have a ton of their bottles. Um, and so, Miles, I'm going to let you kind of take it from here. And, uh, yeah, let's, let's go from there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Karis. And, yeah, thanks, everyone, for having Westward here. I actually have never – observed a blind tasting like that of Westward. That was really, that was pretty fascinating. Um, man, you got, some, you got some good palates out there, that's for sure. Um, it is, yeah, it is single malt. It's 100% malted barley, and it is made north of Mexico, so you guys nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're- North of New Mexico, even. 
Right. So we're, uh, we are Westward Whiskey. We're actually out of Portland, Oregon, uh, up in the Northwest here. And yeah, this is what we do. We make American single malt whiskey. Um, that is, of course, a newer emerging category, something that I think has been getting a lot more traction. And, you know, the more that we bring it out to the world, a lot of us single malt makers here in the States, the more people are um, getting a better idea of what it is and what we're doing. But the other cool thing about, you know, craft whiskey is that we are all taking our own approach to what we think, um, you know, expressing new flavor and expressing the raw ingredients through the distillation process into the bottle actually does. So, you know, yeah, there's a lot of us American single malt makers now, but we, we all have our own unique approach. And uh, we're going to dive in and talk about that with you guys. Um, I understand there's some 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 new people to whiskey here and also some some experts so you know we'll try to cover all the bases and please if you have any questions definitely chime in uh Layla is working the chat and we'll answer any questions you guys have we'll probably have some time at the end too if you know you want to do a a real nerdy q a we can absolutely do that um i am the head distiller and head blender so i do have all the answers um i actually did get to speak with um the Probst Guild, gosh, when was that? Uh, last October, I think is when we yeah. had a chat. Yes, um, October. Yeah, and it was, it was spectacular. I mean, I was just blown away by the knowledge and the expertise and the questions and like just how really fascinated everybody there is with whiskey. So I'm really looking forward to this one. So cheers, everyone. Let's have, a, let's have another little sip of that classic. So, Obviously, when we talk about single malt, for the most part, you know, around the world, people are thinking of Scotland, uh, thinking of Ireland, uh, but of course it's made everywhere. It's made in India, um, Southeast Asia. Um, there's so many places that single malt's being popped up at. Um, Australia has a huge scene there as well. Um, and we're making our version of single malt up here in the Pacific Northwest. And something that really, really heavily inspires us actually is beer. Uh, our founder is an ex-brewer. I am also someone that comes from the brewing world. Most of my distillers are actually all ex-brewers. And you should have got in, uh, in your care package there a little sample of our malted barley. Um, if you haven't checked that out yet, please do go ahead and pull that out. Um, this is the actual barley that we use to make westward. It's grown right here in the Pacific Northwest. It's malted just about 10 miles away from the distillery, uh, trucked here to us where we mash it, mill it, and get it going. But yeah, if you even wanna you know, crush it up in your hands, get a good smell, you can eat it as well. Um, have a taste because a lot of the barley really comes through in this whiskey. It's actually, um, I love that somebody immediately picked up on it. That's really great because we want those raw ingredients to really feature in the whiskey. You know, and, and I, I, I got to tell you, I'm going to interrupt you a half second or miles. Um, we've done tasting events like this with I don't know how many different distilleries. Actually tasting the grain and then sipping the whiskey that goes with it, mind-blowing that the amount of flavor you can tell comes from that grain um, into the whiskey. It's, it's one of the best marketing things I've been a part of. I love it. Well, you know, it, it was actually, it wasn't even marketing idea. It was my idea because it, the barley is so important. You know, it's such an important part of what defines Westward as a whiskey. And we're so particular about it. You know, we, we almost probably annoy our malster to death with how particular we are about the quality of the grain, where it's coming from, who's growing it. Um, and yeah, it's just such a huge part to me, I think, in tasting Westward, especially like this, where you're tasting a few different of our expressions to start with that grain really just opens up the door to understanding what we're doing here. Uh, you know, we say that we are single malt reimagined American whiskey elevated, and that is a lot to do with our approach. And this classic expression right here, I think really embodies all of the ideals of Westward. Um, it is, like I said, made from grain, made from scratch here. We fill into full size, ASBs, what we call American Standard Barrels, the full-size 55-gallon barrels. Um, we make it from scratch. We age it here. Um, it's all done from start to finish with us, and we really want a lot of the elements of the Northwest to come through in the whiskey. I also love that, you know, someone said it doesn't taste like Texas. 
that's I just that's so cool because you really should you know be able to taste some of the I mean some people say provenance um, of just you know the origins of where that spirit is coming from. Um, you are really doing it right. You should. So we're starting with the barley that you have there. We're heavily inspired by beer. Um, I heard also in some tasting notes, I heard apricot, stone, fruit, peach. Um, all those come from our fermentation. So after we've mashed our barley, we're going to use an ale yeast. We actually use a brewer's yeast to make our fermentations happen, which is not too typical of a lot of single malt makers. Uh, we ferment very slowly and at a low temperature uh, to really coax out a lot of those great fruit esters, a lot of those flavors that you guys are getting there. All of that comes from the fermentation. Um, we, really, we really are pretty minimalist in our approach to when we actually distill our wash. We want most of the flavor in the glass when you pour westward to come from the fermentation and to come from that barley. Um, we just feel like starting with excellent raw ingredients and treating them the right way, it's almost like minimalist cooking. You know, you start with excellent ingredients, you have somewhat of this hands-off approach to really let those shine through and give you a really flavorful whiskey. Actually, we. We call our new make, our white dog, before we put it into the barrel, we call it barley eau de vie because it's just so flavorful. It's got so much character. It's really got a lot going on to it. And we want that to be something that lasts through the aging process. But so we're inspired by beer. We're all ex-brewers. Um, we coax out these great beer flavors from the fermentation process. Uh, and we end up with about a 9% wash uh, which is actually pretty low alcohol. Um, and then we move on to distillation. Now, we are pot distilled. Westward is double pot distilled. So um, I understand you guys recently have covered both pot and continuous distillation. Um, I will, yeah, I'll, I'll do a bit of a dive into our distillation process, why we, why we do it the way we do, and how it really shapes Westward in a certain way. Um, you can see in the slides here, uh, in the center and both to the right, um, that's our wash still. That's a 3,000 gallon pot still. We had that designed, custom, and built for us down in Louisville, Kentucky by Vendome Copper and Brass Works. Uh, amazing still makers down there, really fantastic. Um, and if you look at that large still, you can see that, I mean, a 3,000 gallon pot is massive. I actually think it's the biggest pot still west of the Mississippi. Um, and it's just a huge, huge pot. But if you look at that column on top, that copper column, it's actually very short compared to the rest of the still. You can see the boil ball is actually at the very bottom, almost at the pot, and then a very small run up to the top to that line arm. Um, that's very intentional. Um, you guys, you know, you were talking about the legs in the glass earlier and the oiliness. This is where that comes from. This is a very minimalist approach, again, to distilling. Um, it's low reflux, you know, and reflux and distillation is almost like, it's like a refinement of the spirit. You're stripping out some of the characteristics and flavors and body of the spirit to get what you want. Well, we've been so careful up to this point that we really actually want to retain a lot of what's already in there. So this is a, what we call a low reflux still. Um, there's not a lot of reflux happening. And then if you look from the top of that column down to the condenser, that line arm, is actually angled pretty aggressively down. It's like a 45 degree angle down. Um, you see a lot of those are, you know, at a 90 or sometimes even angled up, especially in Scotland. They're a much longer run and they're usually angled up or kind of straight out at a 90. Um, that's to, again, encourage, you know, condensation and reflux and to clean the spirit up a bit more. We want Westwood to be a really robust, bold whiskey that has a lot of flavor and a lot of character and a lot of those nice oily bits that you get from the barley itself. Yeah, when we did the tour out there, I think you remember, that was, I mean, we walked around the corner and saw that, and that's the first thing I pointed out was, what happened to your line arm? And <laughs> <laughs> Is it broken? <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was just it's, it's such a, you know, compared to here in Texas, um, we don't see line arms at that angle, and some of the other stores I've been to, I've never seen one at that angle. But when we got to go up there and actually taste the white dog coming right off the still, that flavor was right there and those oils are right there. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Yeah. No, no, I'm boy. <laughs> yeah. Let's, uh, let's have a conversation. I love it. Really. And, and you know, I did, 
I do like people showing the still because I do think along with tasting the barley, you get this instant connection to what we're doing and why you're tasting and experiencing what you're getting in that glass. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's very unique. It's custom to us. You know, every step of the way in making Westward is meant to express more flavor, never to remove or mask anything. Uh, we really just want to continuously produce a lot of great flavor. Um, and, and we continue to do that with distillation. Um, you know, our second, our second still, our spirit still, um, which is kind of hidden behind the larger big one, uh, you know, but basically the same shape, very short squat column, a very short run through the line arm, down through the condenser. Um, and then, you know, we're really just, yeah, trying to make a very delicious new make. Um, coming off the still, it's at about 142 proof. Then we're going to proof it down with uh, our, our water source here in Portland actually comes out of the mountains. Uh, we're in the Willamette Valley. Um, we've got the coastal mountain range just to our west, and we've got the Cascade Range just to our east. And the Cascade Range actually feeds Portland all of its water. It's really great, clean, super soft water that's excellent for making a lot of beer styles, excellent for making whiskey. Um, it's all just rainfall and snow melt coming down off those mountains. Really, really great stuff. Um, so yeah, we'll cut down to just under 125 proof and start our maturation process. Um, you'll see all these barrels here. Um, actually, it's funny, top left, that's a really old picture. That's our original barrel house. Um, gosh, I don't know, maybe nine, ten years ago, where we could fit maybe 25 barrels. Um, <laughs> and then you see there on the bottom right, that's, that's my maturation facility now. I've got about 4,300 barrels aging in there. Um, so we've, we've grown a bit over the, over the past decade. Um, but yeah, we're using new oak and that's, that's, you know, I think important to what we want to express in our style of American single malt. Uh, because to me, that's a hybrid of styles. You know, a lot of whiskey made in the States, almost all of it really, is put into, you know, virgin charred oak casks. That's just a hallmark of American whiskey is you get more vanilla, you get more baking spice, you get more from the wood in your whiskey uh, than you would say in other world whiskeys. And so, you know, for us, we're, we're bringing those styles together. We're fusing styles of whiskey. We are very much approaching and making Westward like a scotch, but we're aging it like a bourbon. You know, it's, it's getting that contact onto new wood, into new charred oak. And so you're getting a bit of both. And to me, it's the best of both worlds. You know, I think this could appeal to single malt makers and bourbon drinkers as well. It has a lot of elements from each of those. You know, Miles, we, we here in Texas, you know, we're aging our stuff two, three, four years. And you go anything, you know, much past five, six years and the angels are drinking all of it. I mean, we're seeing 10 to 13 percent angel share a year coming out of barrels. Yeah. What is the aging length and what's that look like up in up in Oregon? Yeah, it's definitely not as fast. Definitely not as, as a, our, our angels are a little less thirsty, I'd say for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's funny because, yeah, I mean, obviously environment is so important to maturation. You look at somewhere like Scotland or Ireland where there's a lot of rain, it's very cold. Um, you know, they're aging their spirits for a lot longer. Whereas, yeah, Texas, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, you're getting, you know, wild temperature swings, you're getting really hot summers. And so that's, that's going to have a huge influence on how it's breathing in the barrel, what's evaporating, how it's maturing. Um, for us, we're actually kind of somewhere in the middle. You know, we have hot, dry summers. Uh, it rarely ever hits 100. Um, and then we have cool, wet winters where, yeah, I mean, we're in Portland, we're in the valley, so we see a lot of rain. We see, I think it's something like 30 or 35 percent more than the national average of rainfall here. Um, but it never gets too cold. So, um, you know, it's rarely dipping below 45 degrees Fahrenheit or so, which is actually pretty important for us because once you get below 45, um, aging actually halts. It actually comes to a stop. It really kind of, uh, there's not too much happening with the spirit inside the barrel. Um, so, so, yeah, we're in between those zones there. It's actually really, really great for making our style of single malt. Um, going into the barrel, like I said, just under 125 proof, the barrels that we use are all medium char, or two char and three char, mostly twos, some threes. For us, um, wanting some barrel influence on the whiskey, of course, but not really wanting to override a lot of those great fruit character that you get from the, from the fermentation, and then, of course, the barley. We want all that to really come through. We want that to really jump out of the glass. 
So medium char, and then, you know, as we experience more aging time, uh, I mean, I think it's about a 6% loss in volume our first year, and then really only a 2 or 3% loss in volume every year after that. Um, so yeah, we're not seeing a whole lot of loss, and because we're actually not getting too, too cold or too, too wet, like I said, we're kind of right in the middle, um, we don't see loss in proof. We actually see a rise in proof. We see about a 1% to 2% rise in ABV um, every year. Um, and oh. So, yeah, yeah, actually, um, I think two years ago, uh, a whiskey bar in Chicago bought one of my oldest barrels, and it was, it was up around 151 proof. Um, and I, you know, I told them I'd bring it down, but that's, that's how they wanted it, so, <laughs> so that's what they got. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's important, though, I mean, for everyone, you know, to monitor your barrels, to watch your barrels, to interact with your spirit as it ages. Um, we've talked about this before uh, on these on these chats, but you know I'm a I'm a big fan of Elevage. Um, actually, learned a lot of that from Nancy Fraley, the nose. Um, you know where you're actually you know Elevage. You know for winemakers as well, it means to raise up the barrel. It means to be a part of its maturation. And so as we see more interaction over the years with the wood and actually a rise in proofs, to me it's it's even more important to uh, be on top of what's going on. So um, yeah, I think you can see the bottom left picture there. I'm extracting some whiskey, I'm gonna take a proof and we're slowly proofing our barrels down over time um, for a few reasons. Um, I don't really feel like, you know, Westward would experience too much saponification. That's where if you cut your whiskey too fast, you're actually gonna have a reaction where it starts to taste soapy. You get that in a lot of uh, wood aged spirits, but mostly that are that are on the older side of things. Uh, Westward's designed to be a pretty young whiskey, five, six years tops. We want it to be really bright. We want more of those younger, nice grain notes to come out. Um, you know, I often make the comparison of a grape to a raisin, you know, as to say young versus old. Uh, both are delicious. Both have their own characteristics that we love, but, you know, Westward is certainly designed to be a much younger whiskey. And so, while we're not really at risk of any kind of saponification, we do like to proof down over time because um, there are actual chemical reactions that happen when too much water is added that will actually break up the esters. And the esters are the organic acids that make all those great flavors like you know, honey and fruit and floral, all that's coming from esters. And if you cut down too quickly, you can actually break all those up and lose flavor. Um, Hey, Miles, there was a question about where the oak comes from and a little bit about maybe the, the barrels. What was the first part? Uh, where the oak comes from. Oak. Oh, yeah, oak, of course. Uh, I thought you were saying elk. And I was like, well, <laughs> we've got a lot of coastal range, but... Uh, hey, those, those trophy elk out there by Astoria uh, and... Uh, yeah, those are some, some serious elk. Um, we can we, make some so let me let me preface the question about the the wood and the barrels because in in our conversation with Alex um, over at, at uh, well Alex and and um, Gabe over there at Balconis we were talking about the wood and, and if it's a European oak you're going to get different flavors American oaks different flavor French oaks different flavors and and where that oak is grown it's pulling those flavors from the soil. And that, that has a lot to do with the flavor. So the cooperage and where the, that oak comes from makes makes a difference in what we're tasting. So I think that's the basis of where this question comes from, if that helps set you up a little bit. Absolutely, that's great. And yeah, really, I mean, whiskey is five elements. You know, it's water, it's grain, it's yeast, it's oak, and it's time. So, and each one of those is a very important part of the process. And, you know, yeah, we're, we're getting our, our oak from uh, McGinnis Wood Products, which is down in Cuba, Missouri. Um, they supply a lot of whiskey makers, actually mostly winemakers, uh, with their with their oak. And um, yeah, we've been using them for, gosh, I don't know, probably 12, 13 years now. And we're, we're really happy with what they produce. Um, they've been around a long time. They make excellent barrels. Yeah, I think they've been around for about 90 years, and they're on like the third harvest now of some of their tree farm um, trees. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Um, you know, and yeah, they're, they're always willing to work with us, spend the time talking about 
where we're getting the, the oak from, um, which particular lots, where they're coming from, and how we want it to us. You know, we're, most of our wood uh, for our barrels is 18 month air cured wood. So, you know, that's where they're, before they're cutting them down into stage, you know, they're letting them sit outside for, yeah, about a year and a half. And that's also really important to how that wood is going to affect the flavor of your spirits. I mean, you talk about growing conditions and where that's coming from, where, you know, French oak grows a lot slower. Um, it's not as tight grained as American oak. So, you know, yeah, that spirit is going to access different parts of the wood and extract different things as it would from, yeah, say, uh, Quercus alba, which is American oak. Um, but another thing as well is how that oak is going to be cured. You know, there's kiln drying, which is a period of about 90 days where they're actually putting the wood in massive kilns and they're curing it that way. Um, or you can age it for months and months up to years. And that changes, that changes the actual structure and the, and the chemical makeup of the wood and will definitely affect how that's going to, you know, flavor your whiskey for sure. Yeah, it's very important. Um, there's a great cooperage in uh, West Virginia that is actually also, you know, they're willing to build barrels for you um, that will, that, I mean, they can tell you not only where it came from, but even different parts of the tree. Um, and that's, that's also, you know, something that's well worth looking into, um, you know, because you can have a barrel that's made from, you know, wood that came from several different places um, or at different times of the year, which is also very important as far as what's going on with the chemical structure of the wood. So, yeah, I mean, there is a lot to barrels. Absolutely. Um, I was just noticing, and, and I've done this presentation with you a couple of times now, but it's the first time I noticed that bottom right picture in your warehouse with all the, all the barrels uh, palletized. You got a barrel that uh, it sprung. Um, I'm, I'm going to just go over there and, and kind of lick that, what's coming out of that barrel. You got a couple of them that's got a good leap on them. Um, and, and I only, I only put that out to ask this question. I know here in Texas, we had such a problem with the amount of, of heat and pressure of the breathing of that spirit through those wood staves. Um, guys like Dan Garrison, he actually had to go with a thicker staved barrel because he was having problems with bursting. Um, you know, in Oregon, I mean, coming from there, I know we don't get, but you know, 500 degree days a year, if that, and, and, you know, it's, it's very mild, only hitting hundred for an hour or two and then drops back down again. Um, is that, that's not a result of, of thinner barrel staves, is it? Are you guys going with the smaller barrel staves? What, what are you looking at when you're doing your barrel staves? No, I mean, it's, it's a standard barrel. Yeah. It's the ASB. It's the American standard barrel. It's a standard thickness. Um, yeah, you know, our, our only particular issues, like I said, is that, um, you know, we just see a rise in proof. Um, there's really no real, yeah, there's no extremes and temperature fluctuations that we really see. Um, I mean, you can see the barrels are in a warehouse, but it, you know, it, it isn't temperature controlled. It's ambient temp. Um, so it's just, you know, the temp swings with the season. That's what it does. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing that I really do, um, to the barrels, I mean, I guess more to the environment around the barrels is instead of moving barrels around, you can see they're stacked. We've actually started to stack them even higher than that. But um, instead of, you know, moving barrels around the warehouse, trying to avoid hot spots, cool spots, you know, differences in temperature from the bottom of the stack to the top is I actually have three very large fans at the ceiling that are on timers. And so instead of trying to move around thousands of barrels, I move the air around the barrels. Um, and that really helps as well. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's pretty, pretty mild weather here. You know, again, hot, dry summers, but yeah, as you said, I mean, it gets, it gets over a hundred for maybe a day or two in August and you know, that's it. Um, not a whole lot of humidity in the summer and then yeah, pretty mild rainy winters. Um, yeah. The, the barrels really don't take too much of a beating, which um, you know, is, is, it's kind of unfortunate that as, as of right now, you know, we're only really able to use our barrels once. Um, if anyone is familiar with the American Single Malt Commission, uh, yep. that's something that we helped start. And that is basically a, you know, a lobbying a coalition of single malt makers here that are looking to get the term American Single Malt 
um, officially recognized as a category of whiskey because you know we do want to define a few things that that people can say all right this is american single malt i understand what this is i know what to expect but one of those would be that your new make can actually go into used barrels that that uh, much like the scots and the irish and pretty much everyone else making whiskey um, you can go into a used barrel um, you know it's not something that we want to you know make really rigid and have a lot of rules like um, you know the scottish malt commission but actually really just kind of free everyone's hands to be more creative with whiskey. Um, to say that, you know, if you want to put it in a new barrel, you can, or used barrel, you can. Different sizes, absolutely. Um, you know, and just help kind of define what that category is. For now though, yeah. You're, you're on that commission with uh, Jared Hempstead and, and Alex and the guys from Balconis as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so. they actually, they helped start that with us as well. Yeah, and that, that's, that's a connection that I don't think most people on here realize is we've, we've mentioned a couple names. Nancy Fraley, still Austin, uses Nancy Fraley as her master blender, and you guys use her as well, that, that elevage concept. Um, the relationship with, with Balconis and, and Jared and those guys. Um, so there's definitely a connection between Texas and, and Portland with this product. Um, and I love that it is the grain that we're tasting. We're not tasting charred wood. We're not tasting that Texas heat. We're letting that grain really speak. And it just isn't something that um, we get a lot out of here in Texas. And I really, you know, it's something we talked about when we're up there that you don't use, uh, you know, char three or four. You're going with that lighter char intentionally because you want that grain to speak. And I think you've done a fantastic job with that. Um, I'll shut up and I'm going to, I'm going to, I want the second bottle. Thank you. No, I mean, you know, you can, you can keep complimenting the whiskey all you want. No, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question about fermentation. Okay. Bruce, what was your question? Unmoot. Um, you mentioned it was low and slow. Um, what temperature do you actually hit for? And then when you say long, how long are you doing it? Great questions. Yeah, I did kind of just skim over that with low and slow. Uh, so we're, we're fermenting for about 120 hours. Um, you know, it's about five days. It's a, it's a long fermentation. And we're fermenting at about 72 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow, so, that's low. Yeah, very low. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it's, it's an ale yeast. Um, so it's actually kind of high. It's a little high for that ale yeast, but for whiskey fermentation, it's it's almost cold. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, so so speaking of barrels and fermentation and beer, um, if we can get to our second sample, if you haven't done that already, pour that out. <laughs> yes. 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 That's one. So this is our. Single malt stout cask finish. Uh, this is something that we, I don't know, I guess had wanted to do for years. This, this was sort of a, a natural thing that popped up for us. Obviously, all of us being ex-brewers, you know, being really inspired by beer, but then also having a lot of brewers, you know, still around us here. I mean, Portland has something like 84 breweries in the metro area. Um, just a, a ton of brewers up here, you know, and, um, so of course, when we're done with our barrels, we're, we're just, you know, we're sending them on to breweries. Brewers love to put, you know, their high ABV or dark beers into, you know, freshly empty whiskey barrels. So as we sent those out, um, a brewery actually that I used to work for, um, they'd aged this amazing Belgian chocolate imperial stout in the, in the Westwood barrel. Um, but we actually, we asked for it back, um, thinking that, you know, those great roasty grain chocolatey notes that you get in Westwood would be, be just this, amazing kind of mind-blowing flavor match uh, with a stout finish. So, so that's what we've started doing. It's, it's a cash trading process now where um, we've got this, I don't know, kind of barrel borrowing thing going on with over 40 brewers now here all around Oregon and, and Southern Washington. Um, we're sending our, our barrels out and they're filling them with stout for however long they want to do that. And then, yeah, they send them all back. Um, and we work with a wide variety of brewers too. Um, you know, someone who's just down the street that takes, you know, two barrels at a time, this little brew pub, um, up to Deschutes, you know, Deschutes Brewing, which is probably Oregon's biggest brewer. 
they are, um, they take about 200 barrels of ours at a time where they're aging their abyss in westward barrels. Um, something that's going to accompany this that I think will, you know, help with the tasting is uh, a bit of chocolates. I think we included those in the kits as well. Yes, you did. Great. Right. So this is Woodblock Chocolate. They're actually a Portland chocolate maker, and they used our spent barley in making these bars of chocolate. Um, so, yeah, please uh, dive into that and sip on the, on the, the stout cask along with it. Apologies, I missed it. What was the proof on the first one? Can you go back to the, the first one there, Ian? There you go. It's uh, 90, 90 proof. 90, okay, thank you. Yeah, so, so Westward is bottled at 90 proof, 45%. Um, this stout cask finish is actually bottled at 46%, uh, just a 1% higher. Um, I think it just gives a little more of a, a nice backbone to this, you know, because this is just a little sweeter. Uh, I think this drinks a little better at just a 1% higher. Um, the thing about finishes, and especially for us here at Westward, you know, I'm, I'm always concerned, as I said, about stepping all over the grain and, you know, kind of wiping out some of those great fermentation aspects. Um, I didn't want the finish to be too assertive either. You know, I didn't want to make a stout flavored whiskey. I wanted to make Westward that had some of those stout elements already in it, kind of just highlighted and turned up a bit. And that's what I think is going on here. So we get these barrels back from the brewery. Um, I don't actually rinse them. I don't, I don't, I mean, if there's a couple gallons of beer, of course I'll dump it out, but um, the barrels are <laughs> glass. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Duh. It's called a barrel luge. <laughs> um, so, but they're not steamed. I don't rinse them at all. Um, I want not only the stout elements uh, in a flavor, but also just a lot of the great, you know, mouthfeel that you could get from beer. To me, this is a little drier. This is a little silkier. And I think that's part of, you know, not rinsing the barrel, leaving the leaves in the barrel and picking up some of those characteristics. Um, so yeah, I'm taking about a four year, four and a half year westward, aging it for an additional year in those stout barrels before we release it as stout cast finish. So did they, do the flavors change depending on what beer was originally in the, the barrel? They actually, um, we don't see too much variability. That's a great question. And that was a concern of mine. That was something I wondered about when we started this barrel trade and sending all these barrels all over to these different brewers was, yeah, I mean, not only, you know, a different brewery may have a different style or approach, but then, yeah, a different kind of stout, you know, a Russian Imperial stout or an oatmeal right. stout or, you know, a dry Irish stout. But getting the barrels back, I did not actually see much variability. I think because the, the roasted barley just is so dominant there that, um, yeah, thankfully, I mean, from a, a blender's perspective, you know, I didn't see too much variety from brewery to brewery. So um, this is put together, you know, pretty small batch. I mean, even, even Westward, the standard that we started with, I'm blending maybe 12 barrels together at a time for a bottling. And uh, same with the stop finish, it's maybe 10 or 12 barrels together at a time that we'll put together to make it happen. Um, but yeah, as I said, this really does highlight some aspects of Westward that are already there. It just kind of turns them up a bit more. Some of the chocolatey notes, obviously the grain notes as well. Um, and then, yeah, it's just kind of dried out a bit more. I love the nose on the stout cask. Um, yeah. It's just a little more floral um, and yeah, just a little drier. It's really, really nice. You know, one of the tasty notes on here was milk chocolate, and I think that that hits it just square on the head. That's that's a perfect for me. I, I definitely pick up that milk chocolate on it. Probably because I take chocolate too, but <laughs> I get a little coffee off of it actually. There's a little bit of coffee. I think that's the south flavoring that's coming Probably. through. Yeah. When I first tasted it, I first smelled it first, and I could smell a strong cherry. Now I don't smell that, but the very first smell was cherry. And then when I tasted the chocolate, you could, the malt really came out. It tasted like a malted, like an old chocolate malt from the old malt shops. Yes, that. that's amazing. I love it. Yeah, you know, and, and then again, they're just every step of the way, we want to express more flavor. We want to coax more flavor out of the whiskey. Um, I also, get a bit of cherry in the nose sometimes. But yeah, once that hits your palate and you get that chocolate, 
and the brain, it, it kind of washes that away. But there's a lot of layers to this, definitely. Sure. This gets better, at, like, every time I try it. <laughs> <laughs> Ian wants more. Well, um, shall we uh, move on to our third sample here? Absolutely. My favorite, almost, maybe. Are we gonna, I don't know. We so, okay. I said Do you I sound like James. It? Yeah. <laughs> So you sound like James. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I... So Miles, while we're doing that, how far north do you guys share these barrels with? You guys go up into the Seattle area? Um, we haven't gone as far as Seattle. Um, I mean, we'd be open to it. Um, I'd say, I mean, probably not too much further north or um, east than, say, like, Stevenson, Washington, which is across from Hood River, uh, Oregon, mm -hmm. um, where we we work with Grains of Wrath out there. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say we go too much further north than that. Um, but like I said, if, if a brewer was interested, I'd absolutely trade barrels for sure. Um, so it's so it's very regional right now. It's a pretty yeah, close yeah, spot. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, so Deschutes is actually in Bend, Oregon, which is central. Uh, so they're actually about. Um, 300 miles away, um, and then we've gone as far south as like Eugene, uh, Oregon, which is pretty far as well. Um, About two and a half hour drive. Yeah, yeah, maybe if that. Hey, we're, real quick, um, you guys changed bottle designs, and and Ian's gonna throw a focus on here. The blue bottle is the original Pinot, and then this is your new bottle design that you guys came out with. Um, yeah, a beautiful new design on the bottles. I got I got a kudos to you guys for that. Um, but that was the original bottle. This was what the uh, the original Pinot was. Is the blue bottle, and you can see the diamond shape on the bottle and everything. It's very unique. It stands out in my bar with all the collections. It's definitely a highlighted bottle compared to everybody has this shape. It gives me a term to whiskey diamonds. Whiskey Diamonds. I, you, you know, I actually use that now, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to say, I just, um, I use your, these bottles in my backyard. I put tiki fluid in them and wicks. They're beautiful. Fantastic. I love beautiful it. yard art <laughs> after you're done with the bottle. <laughs> they are. And you know, so this this is actually inspired by the by the Cascade Range, inspired by Mount Hood, which is on the, the picture behind me, and and just yeah, that kind of snaggletoothed uh, skyline that the Cascades give us. So um, yeah, we yeah we're we're super happy with it. Um, our bottling line is not super happy with the new custom <laughs> bottle, but uh, you know we're working on it. Um, uh, well, you know, there's a give and take to everything. Exactly. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> so, so the, your third sample is the Pinot Noir cask. This is another cask finish. Um, this is also inspired by our region, uh, by our area. Um, you know, the Willamette Valley, where we are, and you know, really just a few miles south of the distillery here, we have some pretty amazing world-class Pinot Noir makers. Uh, Pinot Noir is the just absolute legendary varietal that's, that's really sprung up here. What's what put the Willamette Valley on the map for making wine. Um, an interesting note is that we are actually on the 45th parallel, uh, which is the same as Burgundy, France. And so that's why a lot of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir has been planted here in the valley. Uh, it's because they're, they're similar growing conditions. And yeah, I mean, just absolute fantastic Pinot Noir. And much like the distillers here, and much like the brewers here as well, you know, wanting to experiment with new ways to express flavor, um, you know, a wide variety of, you know, someone who's making, you know, a very small amount of just a few cases of wine a year to uh, someone who's making, you know, tens of thousands, a wide, wide variety. But um, we have a great relationship with the winemakers here. Uh, we love their wine. Uh, Christian, our founder, actually used to run a winemaker studio probably about 20 years ago. A lot of you know, kind of upstart winemakers came through and, and they're, you know, really big, famous winemakers now. And so we've always kept in touch with them. We love what they do. And, you know, in, in, the, in the vein of 
wanting to have a new take on what single malt is, or even just, you know, challenge what people's ideals of what a single malt should be. Um, you know, a lot of single malt does really well in wine barrels, you know, like a port or a sherry finish, of course, that's ubiquitous in the, in the single malt world. And, you know, there's really great, you know, wine notes do such wonderful things when you match them up with single malt. For us though, being someone that takes a lot of inspiration from our surroundings, um, being so close to this amazing winemaking region, we didn't think that ports or sherry really aligned with our story. Um, but we have Pinot Noir right here, and thus uh, Pinot Noir was, was born for us, cask finish. Now this is in a French oak wine can. The finish is in a French oak wine cask. So do you think um, you, you start with the American oak to make the single malt, then you transfer that into the French oak with the Pinot Noir, um, how much of these flavors do you think are coming out of that French oak? Um, well, you know, again, wanting to be careful to not, you know, dominate too much of what's already there. But having said that, I mean, a, a good amount of the French oak comes through. It really does. So this is, again, a, you know, four, four and a half year old westward that's, you know, sat in its original, you know, virginal charred oak, white oak barrel for the first four, four and a half years. And then, yeah, it's going to a French oak barrique. Uh, you know, 60 gallon, 225 liter barrel. So this is French oak that, you know, they're toasting the wood. They're not charring it like you would, you know, right. a barrel for whiskey or for cognac, say. Um, for wine. You know, the right. So it's, it's a bit of a less aggressive way of coaxing some flavors out of the wood. Um, so it's a different process. And then, yeah, that French oak is more herbaceous. Um, it's just got some different elements to add to the whiskey. And I, and I think that's definitely here. I think that's present in the Pinot cast. So it's a year finish in these French oak barrels. An interesting thing to note about Pinot Noir that's made here in the Willamette Valley, um, you know, oak barrels are very expensive to get because French oak grows so slowly, you know, they'll fell a, you know, 200, 300 year old tree and really only get maybe one or one and a half barrels out of that entire tree. So they're very expensive to get. And so winemakers, especially here in the Willamette Valley, they'll actually use their barrels three times. They'll do three vintage fills on their barrels before they send them to us. Um, so I've actually talked to a winemaker about this. He says his, his Pinot Noir barrels are 10 pounds heavier when he gives them to me as opposed to when he gets them in new. So these <laughs> trees are soaked with Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. It's really, really cool, really interesting. Uh, so here's, I have a question. I, I don't have the answer to this. I'm, this isn't a softball question at all. And, and just so you guys know, we don't script this, all right? This, this is completely off the cuff. When I throw out a question at these guys, they don't know what's coming at them. Miles does not know this question, um, but I'm sure he knows the answer. Does the alcohol content in the whiskey that you're putting in that barrel, is it more stringent? Does it pull out additional flavors that the wine left behind or the beer left behind because that was at a much lower proof? Absolutely. Absolutely it does. But you know, that's also, there's a balancing act there because the more times the barrel is filled, the more neutral it becomes, right? Okay. The less assertive, the less that the, the oak itself actually has to give. I mean, you fill a barrel enough times and it's essentially neutral. It's basically just gonna be a holding vessel uh, sure. for whatever you put in it. So yeah, you know, it's interesting because you, you are putting in a spirit that, you know, yeah, wine is, you know, anywhere from what? you know, Pinot Noir, eight to maybe 12%. Yeah. Uh, where then you put this spirit that's, you know, 54 um, to, you know, 60%, 62 and a half percent ABV, it's going to extract more. But because this barrel, this Pinot Noir barrel is now on its fourth fill, um, it's, it's not as aggressive. It, it's, it's a bit more neutral. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're definitely pulling out a lot of the Pinot Noir flavor that's there and then extracting some of that French oak as well. And that's something I think you really get a lot in the nose of the Pinot Noir. Um, it's, it's a bit more refined. It's a bit more sophisticated. Um, it's a little more demure, I guess I'd say. Um, and what it's really bringing out a lot from, west, from, the, from the westward, from the whiskey, that's, that's really already there, that's part of the core elements, is the grassiness, the fruitiness, um, some of the herbaceousness that you can find kind of underlying westward. Um, all that is complemented by that Pinot Noir that's really just pushing a lot of that out. 
So I want to I want to show this real quick to kind of educate the the crew. Um, if you can be focused here, this is a wood stave. This is actually a barrel stave from a whiskey that's charred. See the red line? That's how far the spirit soaked into that barrel. So that's how, I mean, if you think of how hard oak is, it soaked that far in and back out. So all those, the sap, the tannins came out of that wood that deep. So this is something that I've always really appreciated as a, as a good showpiece to kind of give you an idea how far the spirit soaks into a barrel. Sorry, Miles. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, we call it the red line. You know, how far that spirit is going to actually go into the wood. And that's why it is so important to um, understand curing oak and why, why it needs to be done a certain way, because there's just so much interaction with that wood, for sure. Um, yeah, and you know, we've, we've, since we've had such great results with Pinot Noir, um, winemakers here, you know, they, we've done uh, Chardonnay finish, we've done Tempranillo finish, um, just kind of one-offs here and there. Um, Tempranillo's right here. There's the Tempranillo. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. We had fun in the airport. First yeah, I spent a little bit of money at the airport that day. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of, uh, you know, using barrels uh, several times, that Tempranillo finish that you have there, that was our very first uh, Whiskey Club release. And that was a 500 liter, that was a punch-in that uh, winemaker Patrick at Dominio 4 had filled with Tempranillo. It makes incredible, incredible wine. Well, so we filled that up with, you know, about two and a half barrels of Westwood. We released that after only about six months and finished because it just had so much to give. And then once we emptied that, I filled it back up and we're actually, I just blended it yesterday. Uh, we're going to release it through the club again uh, in May. And so, yeah, you'll have the uh, first and second fill on that Tempranillo punching coming to you. Oh, wow. Well, we just did a first and second fill on a Madeira cast with Balcones right. uh, a week ago. Yeah. So, that's thanks. amazing. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. So, we're going to talk. Are we going to talk about what I think we're going to talk about now? Well, I was going to wait. Yeah, I was going to wait for you to, yeah. <laughs> well, my, my, my administrator just left, so I need to um, hop out of here and stop to the screen share if I can. Um, well, we've made the comment that we've picked up whiskey at the airport before, and I don't know if anybody knows, but uh, Port the Portland airport has um, a Westward whiskey tasting room in it. So you can go to the airport and sit and have a whiskey or a cocktail and buy bottles. Well, I don't, they're not open. I mean, Oregon's not open like Texas is yet, I don't think. So you used to be able to sit and have a cocktail. Um, yeah. Austin but you definitely buy bottles. Yeah. And it's, it's past, it's on the good side of cure, uh, on the good side of security. So when you, you can buy a bottle there and take it with you on the plane. And <laughs> Carry it on the airplane. You can't open you can, it. You well, can't open it and drink it on the They airplane. highly request that you do not open it. I think they throw you out of the plane. You do. Yeah, yeah 30,000 feet. <laughs> they, um, they threaten you. All right, so I, I know we're getting close on time here. And we have a big announcement we'd love to make. And uh, how, how do you guys feel about westward whiskey in general i know miles is on here layla's on here but is this a thumbs up guys absolutely a thumbs up absolutely and i absolutely. saw on here zach was trying to get hold of a, a cask release that was done at seven grand a local uh, a whiskey bar in downtown nickel city. nickel city i'm sorry nickel city downtown um and we we actually have done a thing at seven grand with um with miles um, what would you guys think about a Probst Guild barrel pick of Westwood? Would anyone be interested in that? Yeah, Single malt, Pinot, which one? Which one? Miles, would you like to tell us about the barrel? We have selected a barrel. <laughs> yeah, oh, so you're not really asking us, bad. you're telling us. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're getting a barrel, damn it. Surprise. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, we, um, what was that about two, three weeks ago? I had, I had um, handed off some barrel samples. I hand selected a few different uh, single barrel samples, handed them off. 
And then, um, yeah, we did a we did a virtual tasting, and um, you guys selected an absolutely fantastic single barrel of Westward. Cast three hundred one. Cast number three hundred one. That's right. Um, yeah, super, absolutely delicious barrel. Um, you guys, you're gonna get it at Cast Strength. Um, absolutely fantastic whiskey. Really nice pick. Mm -hmm. So let me, uh, for everybody, I'll, I'll get, and, and by the way, I have like the last little bit of it right here. And um, I, poured, I poured myself some too. Did you really? <laughs> this is so delicious. So this is really good. Where's our sample? I was going to say, um, save that for next it, weekend to model. bring to me, James, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the fifth. You're going to be able to buy at the store as soon as it's released. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll tell you guys what, what the process was. And, and we've done a couple barrel picks now. We did one with Balconis. We, we had one with Garrison Brothers that gave us two bottles. <laughs> um, so this is, this is actually our second barrel pick we, we've done. Um, and what was amazing, and, and, and you know, kudos to, to Miles and, and Westward, um, Miles curated a selection of, I think it was four or four or five bottles, um, four, four barrels. Yeah. And, he he first, and this is this is what I love working with a blender as well as a distiller. Um, he picked something that was, this is Westward's flavor. This is what we're going for when we pick a flavor. And then he picked something that was an outlier. I really liked how this highlighted the barley. I really liked how this highlighted this flavor and that barrel. And this barrel was such a unique flavor. It was an outlier. And so we weren't just tasting, oh, it's the same thing with slight nuances. These were at four polar opposites of the flavor spectrum for what Westward picks as what they consider the, you know, their quintessential flavor. Um, this barrel, 301, the, the nose is very similar to what you have, much more concentrated. And remember, this is cask strength. Now, when we say cask strength, with a distiller that does elevage, like Westward Whiskey, um, they've added water to slowly proof it down or to moderate the proof over time. So this was a question some of you asked Josh from Still Austin uh, on Monday, right? You asked about a cask strength and what that would look like for a barrel that's been elevated. Uh, Miles, do you remember what the cask strength was on this, this barrel? I do, I do, and man, you're just, you're going to make me reveal all my blending secrets here today. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> so, so this is actually, this is actually at 62.5%. This is right at 125 proof, which it certainly drinks a lot. It does food. not taste like that. Oh, it no, does, it does not, not drink like that so, at all. So part of my elevage process is, you know, I'll take barrels about a year, a year and a half into aging. That's where I start to do some serious proofing down. Um, but there's certain barrels that to me are just so unique that I just kind of let them go. Um, and this was one of those barrels. So, so this has been proofed down here and there. I mean, otherwise, you know, cause it's, it's now at five years. So, you know, this should be actually closer to 130 proof. Um, but I've slowly proofed this down just a little bit, but this is, this is part of my single barrel selection process is early on in its life. Um, I see a barrel going a certain way and I actually will just let it go. <laughs> Is that the last of it? <laughs> and actually... <laughs> Wait, you should let Ian have some yeah. Well, so, so yeah, this is actually, this is pretty true to cast. <laughs> Um, because this was I can't. I cannot wait until the, we get this one. Yeah, we're gonna cut. We're, we're we're we will probably be buying about a case of this ourselves. This is just fantastic. Um, so I think we we picked a, about a month out, right? Is what I think Karis talked to you about on this. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, I just actually I just got it on the uh, the bottling schedule today. Um, not for today, but got it on the schedule. We're actually. Um, <laughs> we're actually about another week or two of bottling. We have this massive order going to Australia. I did a custom blend actually for a whiskey club down there. Um, and they ordered 20,000 bottles of it. So Good Lord. Oh. <laughs> so we've got a big bottling to kind of finish up here in the next couple of weeks. Um, but um, yeah, I got it. I got it on the schedule. And yeah, we're looking at a late May 
uh, release for you guys. Yeah, that I wasn't know a club. That was a country. That's insane. I know we're small potatoes, um, but I think this is outside of the Total Wine and Nickel City. This is one of the first club picks you've done in the state of Texas, isn't it? It is. It absolutely yeah. is. You know, and, and I mean, Nickel City, that was our first, and that was – that was arranged just because Travis Tober is actually an old co-worker and an old friend. So he, he got in there right away. Um, but yeah, <laughs> this is definitely one of the first um, single barrel picks to go to Texas. Yeah, and, and we really appreciate, I mean, one coming back on the airplane with as many, we had the, the four um, boot flasks with the barrel picks. Plus we had bought several of, and we haven't talked about this yet. And, and, I want to talk about this one, if you don't mind. And I know we're, we're, we're kind of up against the clock, and Maz, I hope you don't mind sticking around a little bit longer. Um, I actually, I want to say that our the barrel we picked not only has a great mouthfeel, but, like, the flavors are outstanding. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is – and I, you guys have heard me say this several times. It's one of, you know, it's one of my favorite bottles, right? Um, we did the single malt from Balcones. And for a Texas single malt, it is absolutely wonderful. The bourbon from Still Austin, it is one of my favorite bourbons. This single malt is one of my favorite single malts. As the category of American single malt goes, this, this bottle that we picked, 301, this barrel, is just beautiful. And it is a quintessential single malt. You get those barley flavors. You get the malting flavors. You get the caramels. You get the wood flavor that's just there, but it doesn't overpower. This is Westward whiskey in a bottle. It is the definition of Westward whiskey. Um, it is not so high proof that, you know, oh, wow, I, I need to add ice to this or I need to water it down. It drinks perfectly straight across. And we, we tried that, Miles. If you remember, one of the barrels, we're like, wow, I really like this with a couple drops of water. It was, it was better when we doctored it. And we decided to go with this one because it drank perfectly out of the bottle as it was without any doctoring. Um, and, and just so you guys know, one of the people that helped us pick this bottle um, was Shannon Hood. Shannon Hood is out of the East Texas Bourbon Society, up out of uh, that other Tyler, um, Taylor, up in Tyler. in Tyler, Taylor. Yeah. Taylor's closer. Yeah, the other one. Um, Taylor Long. Further, Long further out. And neck, yeah, Longview, Nacogdoches. Uh, she also is the Tawakaro um, ambassador from Tawakaro. And she helped pick this bottle with us. And um, uh, there were a couple of you guys that we included in this. And I'm sorry we didn't include everyone, but um, it's a fantastic bottle. There will be a process to purchase this. You will actually pre-register and pre-purchase the bottle, bottles, and then we'll go collect them all and, and help distribute that through the distributor that we're picking. Um, um, you know what? Read the message. I'm reading a message. Tober is fun to party with. Zach, you a wild boy, aren't you? Um, <laughs> um, did we discuss the name of the distillery and the logo? Uh, Kenny Westward Whiskey is who we're, we're working with. Um, sure. You have a question about the logo? I wonder if he's talking yeah. about the arrow and the degree of it. <laughs> Kenny, you are muted, but you are just carrying on conversation oh, with yourself. He's just talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's about the logo and our, our name, yeah? Is that right? So, so we're, we're West. Correct. That's, that's what I was wondering. Gotcha. Yeah, we are, you know, we are, um, we're in Oregon, man. We are in Portland. We are at the end of the Oregon Trail. We are. Uh, we say opening new territory when it comes to whiskey. Um, so we're inspired by exploration. We're inspired, we're inspired by pioneering. Um, and so that's where the name Westward comes from. And the, the arrow through the W is actually is, is pointing Northwest. Um, if you were to look you know, at a compass, it would uh, point up to us. So, so Westward is, is all about our place and where we are and how we got here. Um, Miles, and, and you can see, I, I just poured a, a nice pour, um, and, and Mike, you know, and, and a couple of my coworkers around here, you may or may not see me at the office tomorrow. 
Um, so, yeah, we're drinking the two malts, and you graciously poured us a boot flask from your personal bottle under your desk when we were at the distillery um, up there around Christmas time. Um, it is absolutely fantastic. Can you tell us about this two malts? Because I, I will tell you right now, you've heard me say a whole bunch of times, my favorite. This is one of my favorite bottles across every whiskey. If you came to my bar and tried everything in my bar and everything I've ever had, this is one of my favorite whiskeys, period. Yes. Across the board, this is it. He poured a drink for himself out of the boot flask, gave me a sip. And, and drank the boot flask. Drank the boot flask <laughs> and three quarters of the bottle that we brought back. And it was gone probably by the beginning of March. Oh, yeah. It was, it was Ian and I had a night. It was a great night. <laughs> Miles, please tell us about this bottle. Well, and, you know, and thank you so much. It's, it's really great. You know, you, you love to see something like this um, get appreciated that way. I, re I really thank you. That's so cool. So this, we call this two malts. This has been, uh, this is actually our second release. Um, but this is two different malted grains. So this is 70% malted barley, our standard Westward grain, and then 30% malted wheat. And, you know, wheat, of course, is used a lot in whiskey to soften the palate, to kind of bring out some good fruit notes. Um, it's really just this great flavor enabler you know it really acts like that way and we have in central oregon um actually just outside of ben and madras there's a family farm they call themselves mecca grade they're fifth generation grain growers and uh they grew this wheat for us so this is a soft white winter wheat that they malted right there on their farm and then sent to us and that's what we use to make this two malts that is rare to have the farmer actually malt their grains. Well, yeah, so here's the thing. So the, the son who's running it now, he's about my age. He is a huge beer nerd. He's just a fanatic for beer. And so he actually built a small brewery on the farm. I mean, it's just <laughs> private, it's for himself. But then he also started doing floor malting and he found a way, he found this equipment to where he could basically mimic floor malting with this equipment. And so, yeah, he, he malts all the grain that he grows for brewers and distillers. It's pretty incredible. Really, really cool. Wow. You know, the one thing that I would love to see is add a malted rye component to this and have the three malts well, of so that rye. Our first release of the two malts was actually rye. It was malted rye and, and our malted barley. Um, so, yeah, maybe yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe we should do a little three malts. Just so you know, <laughs> there's a box. So I want to I want to point out a couple things that we have here. Um, and again, I, I've said this at, at every event. My bar is open. All right. If there's a bottle I don't want you to have, it gets put away. We have probably a, a very extensive selection of Westward, and you'll notice that there's three bottles back here of the two malts. But some of this, this is Bridgeport Pill Bridgeport Brewing and Kingpin Red Ale, and it's 68 malted barley and 32 malted rye from two different brewers. Yeah, Ian's waving for the bottle over there. Um, <laughs> you have tried this already. <laughs> and then we have, a, we have another one here that was the malted wheat and the malted barley, bottle 71, and then the one we tried. So these are the same. They're, okay, cool. We have an extra bottle of that? I've, yes. You bought, you drank yeah, the entire fine. bottle on your own. <laughs> I had to buy two. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about some of the other stuff you have going on. You've got the women. Um, you, you've got, you've got several things going on here. So, yeah. yeah. So I'll touch quickly on that Bridgeport bottle. So, so that's actually something that we've done probably a dozen or maybe 15 times now. Again, us being ex brewers, we love beer. We love brewers. Um, that, that Bridgeport Kingpin Red Ale, that is something that was actually really near and dear to my heart. So when I got out of brewing school, that's where I brewed first, was at Bridgeport Brewing, which was an Oregon craft beer, just, I mean, they were, they helped form the scene here. They were making IPAs, you know, in the, in the mid 80s, 
when you know a lot of people here didn't know what that was. But were you right down the waterfront, right there off of Front Avenue at the Bridgeport? Um, they had a tasting room down there, right by the marina. They did have a tasting room there. The brewery uh, was in the Pearl District. It was an old rope factory, um, but it yeah. was started by the Ponzi's, a wine family here in the early '80s. I mean, they were just a huge, huge part of the brewing scene here. Well, I, that's where I landed right out of brewing school. I worked there for a while making beer. Uh, but about maybe five years ago or so, when we got our big wash system installed in the distillery here, we realized that we basically had a 30 barrel craft brewing system. And so we started to invite brewers to come over um, and we you know, have a little whiskey, have a little beer and decide which of their beers we would turn into whiskey. So this is actually Bridgeport Kingpin Red Ale. We cloned their beer recipe on our wash system, made it, and then double pot distilled it and turned it into Westward Two Malts. And that's what the Kingpin is. Um, we've done that since with um, Deschutes, Fort George, which is a great brewery that makes amazing stouts here on the coast. Um, yeah, that's just mm -hmm. one of those things that we're really, really excited to do. Um, but yeah, our single barrel program has expanded massively. Um, we're actually doing a lot with um, a lot of benefit barrels now. Um, we just did a pick actually for yeah International Women's Day, which was March 8th. Um, we had Erin uh, Hayes, who's our VP of sales. And, uh, she's also a partner with the company. She teamed up with five other just amazing industry leading ladies um, throughout the beverage industry. And they, um, they picked a single barrel and that's what was released um, back in March. Um, we picked a, you know, a charity for that to benefit and all, yeah, all proceeds went that way. So, um, yeah. This is last cool. year's bottle, I believe. Yeah, this is last year's bottle, but we, we, so we that, have. That was actually picked by Claire, Claire Longyear, who's a, a distiller here. She's one of my distillers. She picked that barrel out herself the year before. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you guys, I, I'm so excited that you guys got in on our single barrel picks. I'm excited that you're you know, you're getting one of the few that are going down to Texas and it's an absolutely killer one too. So cheers to you guys. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you. So thank you for allowing us to so, be a part of it. So we're going to, we're going to, so